Sama Sambudasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Budang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami So I just uh, told all of the Thai people that I was going to be talking about faith and that it's something that I don't really need to say much about in Thai because faith is something which uh, most Thai people just grew up with. It's like a, a fish in water. You know, you don't need to tell a fish much about water because they live in it all the time. And but for us growing up in in the West, growing up uh, in countries where Buddhism was not the primary religion, um, it's something that we have to learn, learn about something we have to to train in. And it's often hard because even the word uh, the word faith in English is a concept which is all mixed up with uh, baggage from other religions, from other concepts. Uh, if we grew up in a a non-Buddhist family, which most of us did. Uh, faith may have been applied in a way just to get us to shut up and not ask questions or to not look critically at things, just have faith, um, this kind of thing. So a lot of us have a broken relationship with faith. But I thought it would be useful to talk about this subject because uh, quite a number of us are on pilgrimage. So there's a group of about 28 lay people and myself and Ajahn Nisibo um, from Seattle. We're starting a monastery called Clear Mountain Monastery and we don't yet have an actual monastery place, but uh, have a growing group of people in Seattle and the surrounding area who are very interested in learning more about the Dhamma and practicing Dhamma and we've decided to come on this uh, about a week in Thailand and then a week in Bodh Gaya pilgrimage, basically to where our roots are, our Buddhist roots, our monastic roots, uh, to learn about the tradition and to really soak in the beautiful aspects of faith, the beautiful aspects of a Buddhist culture, which we just don't see. In the West, we've got these little pockets of Buddhism, these little bubbles, these monasteries are, are like little bubbles of belief and they're beautiful for what they are, but then you leave the bubble and nobody knows what you're talking about and nobody knows why you're wearing these robes and it's just a, a weird thing for many people. But here, yeah, monks are respected, you know, and it makes sense and coming to a monastery is a very normal thing. So we're on pilgrimage. We've crossed the Pacific Ocean, spent uh, thousands of dollars to fly in planes and buses to vans to get here. And that's a lot of movement. Um, but I think one useful way to conceive of pilgrimage for all of us, um, those who've been traveling from America or those who are online or those who are just in this monastery, you can think of pilgrimage actually as just a profound way of going nowhere, actually. So pilgrimage, what we're trying to find, what we're looking for on pilgrimage, whether it's to Thailand or to India or to our local monastery or to the meditation hall or to our meditation cushion or just in the present moment is basically a place of rest and we want to find that and the only place we can find that is in the present moment. So how do we balance these two things of intensely searching but also acknowledging and realizing that what we're searching for can only be found right here in this present moment right now within our own bodies and minds and this is where faith and growing in faith, or let's use the, the Pali term sadha. That's where sadha or confidence or trust, this is where this quality 
can grow in flower and really provide a cool resting place, not just a, a place to sit and grit our teeth and bear it, but it can be a beautiful place. It can provide a coolness for the heart uh, when we allow this quality of sadha to, to grow. So when we come to meditate right now, whether we're listening to a talk or giving a talk or meditating, in meditation, there are basically just two things that we have to do in daily life, in Buddhist practice, there are basically just two things that we have to do. And that is to know. So knowing, bringing awareness to the present moment, right here and right now, that's the goal. And it's apparent here and now. That's the first thing, just knowing. And the second thing is letting go. So knowing and letting go, that's the heart of meditation. And really, it's also the heart of, of faith, of sadha. At the most basic level, this sadha is having the faith that it is possible to know, that knowing or being the puru, this, this knowing capacity, uh, it is, we can tap into that. Um, oftentimes when you hear senior monks, Ajahn Sumedho, or really any of our Kuba Ajahns talk about knowing, it can sometimes seem a bit esoteric. Like what are they talking about? It almost seems like a magical way of thinking, just being the knowing or being the knower. Like what are they talking about? It seems, it can seem oftentimes just too profound on a whole another level that we can't actually tap into, but what the faith is on one level in relationship to this knowing is that it is <laughs> an aspect of consciousness, of vijnana, or of chitta, or of the mind that can just know really that is the heart of consciousness. That's all consciousness does is just knowing. But we're not always able to, to stay with that. So we nurture this faith that this knowing can blossom and it does get more and more expansive. And the second aspect of faith is summarized in a really beautiful sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of the Twos, where the Buddha says, it is possible to abandon unwholesome states. If it were not possible to abandon unwholesome states, I wouldn't say, monks, practitioners abandon unwholesome states. But because it is possible to abandon unwholesome states, I say, do it, do it, abandon unwholesome states. And similarly, it is possible to cultivate, to develop, to bhavana wholesome states. If it weren't possible, I wouldn't say to do it, but because it is possible, the Buddha says, do it. So that's the second level of faith. And you might say, well, yeah, of course, but not really, of course, if we really uh, were able to <laughs> live that truth or have that faith every moment, then nothing will be a problem. Because as soon as a problem arises, then you'd have the, the faith, the belief, it is possible to let go of this problem. And then you would just work at it. And so that's the second aspect of faith. A, uh, a friend of mine, um, he's a, a Zen monk, and Zen, they've got these kind of pithy ways of talking about, and almost uh, paradoxical ways of talking about the path and about things, pretty much everything. It's always a paradox or in Zen. But he was talking about faith, and he was saying that faith is skill in doubt. Yeah. So faith is learning how to doubt. So faith is an education. We're learning how to doubt intelligently. And as Westerners, we need to get our doubt under control. So doubt or wichikicha is the fifth of the five hindrances. And it's one which 
everybody deals with it to some extent, but I think people who grew up in a culture which fetishizes and praises and uh, just exalts the thinking mind and really the skeptical mind to such an extent, we think that doubt is the path. And if we're good at doubt, then it can be the path. That's what the Buddha said to the Kalamas, you know, don't, you're, you don't have, you're uh, skeptical of those things which are deserving of skepticism. But when we come to this path, we are not yet good at doubting. We don't know what to doubt. We just follow along with whatever our culture or our teachers or whatever philosophers we read or our own biases. Um, we just think, oh yeah, you know, this teacher or this book or whatever, or my own thoughts are saying, don't trust this. And maybe you're right and maybe you're wrong, but uh, learning how to doubt intelligently. In the Dhammapada, there are a number of verses, I believe around uh, 316 to 319, something like that, where the Buddha says that people suffer because you fear those things which shouldn't be feared and you have shame about those things which shouldn't be you shouldn't be ashamed about and you doubt those things which you shouldn't have doubt about so the buddha is acknowledging that there are things to fear there are things to be ashamed about and there are things to uh, doubt about but um yeah we need to learn and practice and look at our own hearts and it's not about just following some scripture or follow, following what some teacher says, uh, but about looking at the results in our own heart. Um, that's a big part of it, but that's not the whole of it. And that's why we, we've come all the way to Thailand. Uh, in my experience and the experience of many people, uh, there's what you can call this like faith knock on effect. So for many Westerners, we started being interested in Buddhism because we go to a meditation retreat and oftentimes a meditation retreat, which totally takes Buddhism out of the picture. So you go to a Goenka retreat and he's a genius at basically saying, this is not Buddhism. And he's right on a certain level. We're just paying attention to the breath at the tip of the nose, just scanning the body. There's nothing Buddhist about that. And that's a great place to start um, for people who don't have a Buddhist base. Uh, but then you start doing that and you try to live, you know, just knowing the breath at the tip of the nose, scanning the body. And at some point um, you might say, oh yeah, but is there, isn't, is there more? And then you start listening and it turns out that Goenka or these other teachers actually teach, they're teaching Satipatthana. Okay, they're teaching a sutta. They're teaching something which is from this thing called the Pali Canon. So then you start reading the Pali Canon, not just the Satipatthana Sutta, the suttas are big. There are so many of them. And you start reading one, and then you have a teacher or a friend who says, oh yeah, if you're interested in speech, here are a bunch of discourses where the Buddha talks about speech. And then you say, it's this knock on. So I have faith in what the Buddha said about meditation. And then, oh yeah, I'm curious, what does he say about, about speech? Or what does he say about livelihood? Yeah, and these are fascinating things which you don't necessarily get from just watching the breath. So, okay, I'm starting to have faith in the suttas, but not, not all the suttas. And then you hear a teacher talking about the suttas, like for people who um, know Thai and maybe know a little bit of Pali for the talk that Ajahn Nun gave this morning or the teachings that um, Lompo Cha or any of the teachers in the Thai forest tradition give, they are so totally steeped in the Pali tradition they are teaching the word of the Buddha verbatim at times. Um, you've got, they pull words out. Just this morning, uh, Ajahn Anand talked about sati or mindfulness. He talked about uh, upeka, metta, karuna, mudita. Um, he was constantly referring back to these concepts, which you see and you find in the Pali Canon, but which are only flushed out to a certain degree. You read the Pali Canon, and you can get a lot of uh, sustenance from reading them. But when you have teachers who've lived them since the time they were teenagers and before, and who 
not only know the words, but have lived them and actually penetrated to the truth of them, then we can take that and learn from them. They're a living example. They're the living Tepitaka in many ways. So the faith, it knocks on and it just, we can bring it more and more into our hearts because that's eventually, that's where we're going on pilgrimage and that's where we're at on pilgrimage. That's where faith has to start and that's where faith is going to end. Faith is a power. Um, there's a, a beautiful tradition, which we might see on our pilgrimage here in Thailand, uh, in forest monasteries, you'll notice the color of our robes. Um, they are, in each Buddhist country, the colors of the robe um, are originally related to the natural flora and fauna of the, or the, the wildlife, or the, uh, the plants of that country. So in Tibet, they've got these purplish robes because it's juniper berry. And here in Thailand, as forest monks, our robes are dyed from jackfruit dye. So basically the process of getting natural dye from jackfruit is you take uh, these different sections of jackfruit heartwood and you chop, 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 chop to get these chips of, jack, of jackfruit from these sections, maybe a foot or two wide. And then you boil those down and you boil it and you keep boiling and keep boiling. You boil it overnight. Sometimes you boil it for 48 hours to get all of the, uh, the essence, all of the color out of these jackfruit um, heartwood chips. And then you've got this concentrated solution which you can dye white cloth with. And I think it's a beautiful simile for, um, for the practice in general. It can be a beautiful simile for faith, uh, but it can also be um, a beautiful simile for specifically for the meditation object, Budo. So this can be a theme for people who are open to it. Uh, this meditation word, Budo, is something which is taught by all of the teachers that will visit Ajahn Suchat, Ajahn Jayasaro, Ajahn Cha. Longtan Mahabua, we won't meet him, he's passed away. Um, Umpu Man, all of these great teachers, uh, they all taught this meditation word, Budo. And what that is, if you're open to it, again, <laughs> hopefully what we can do on pilgrimage is meet with the extremities of what we're comfortable with. We are coming to a foreign country, eating food we're not used to, living in a temperature we're not used to, we're in the boundaries of our comfortable, comfortable level. We're at the peripheries of what we uh, can stand, what we can be patient with. So if people are open to it, uh, Budo, <laughs> it's not magic. It doesn't have to be a religious. If you're not ready to take on a two-syllable word, you can use any meditation word you want. But this Budo is saturated. It is filled with lots of meaning already, and you can fill it even more with more meaning. So if you can take this meditation word, Budo, using it with every in-breath, but, and every out-breath, to, but, to, put, to, or even without the breath, just knowing, but, to, or listening, but, to, and seeing what, what comes up. And everything we're taking on this morning, we asked a question of Ajahnanan, what's the most important aspect that we can, most important skillful qualities that we can bring to the practice and a spiritual life? And Ajahnanan said, metta and knowing the three characteristics of impermanence, non-satisfactoriness, and not self, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. And this word, buddho, can be all of that. So all of these beautiful mental qualities, which the Buddha praised, every aspect of the Eightfold Path, every aspect of the 37 Wings to Awakening, every aspect of right effort, of right speech, they're like individual footlong sections of this heartwood. And we can boil them down, concentrate them, and epitomize them in this two-syllable word, Budo. So when we recite Budo, it's a symbol 
for all of these good qualities. It's a symbol for metta. It's a symbol for patience. When we need patience, when we're starting to complain and say, it's too hot, or this guy's talking too long, or I don't like the food, or I'm hungry, or whatever it is, use the Budo mantra to be patience. Use the Budo mantra to tap back into that essence of faith, which sees clearly, knows clearly, oh, this is, this is just complaining, or this is just dislike. You can know that, and then to the extent that it's not helpful, you can use that Budo mantra to abandon it, to let it go, to have the faith that it is possible to let go, and that that would be a good thing. Just not having to hold on to it and be obsessed with and just follow after our own cultural and personal conditioning. So with metta, this word Budo can be the essence of that every time uh, judgments come up about the other people in our group. We're traveling in five different cars with strangers who we don't know and humans smell and we talk in ways that other people aren't used to and there are all sorts of sense impingements that we're not used to. So Budo, knowing that and yeah, this is just a smell. This is just a sound um, and we can let it go. And then every step, every moment can be a moment of pilgrimage, a moment of faith, a moment of, of practice. And we can let go of all those things which uh, furrow our brow, furrow our yeah, openness and receptiveness to, um, to the Dhamma. And um, this can be a whole path of opening and just having patience. If we can't let go, then Buddha, just knowing that. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone can uh, take this to heart and really use this Buddha mantra for all of the pilgrims through the whole of our day, every day of our pilgrimage, or whatever your, your meditation object is, using that and remembering to come back to it and having the faith in that, whatever it is. And then from this seed kernel of faith, this seed kernel in the teachings of the Buddha, in the meditation, in the teachers, then that can blossom in all these things which we're not familiar with. Talk about bodhisattvas, talk about other realms, about dragons or nagas or devas and things that we're not familiar with. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe there's something there or maybe there's not. And just having the, uh, the heart to be open to that and maybe it can help our practice. So all in the English there and maybe just Sarup, I Kuan Tai Fang, just summarize a little bit in Thai. <laughs>